This is KGW News at Sunrise. Good morning and good to see you here on this Sunday. I'm Galen Etlin. The time now is 7 o'clock and this morning the Burnside Bridge is closed for the second straight day of work. It should reopen tonight around 6. We'll give you the outlook. Plus, preparations are underway for mass COVID vaccinations next week at the Oregon Convention Center. We'll look at what it means for you. But before that, Keely Chalmers joins us live at home with the forecast. How's it going, Keely? Hey, good morning, Galen from my basement on this Sunday morning. A little wet out there right now, but hey, we're looking at a pretty dry and partly sunny day by this afternoon. Let's take you out to Yaquina Bay right now in Newport where the waters are calm. We are going to see that swell increase and some uh, sneaker wave potential uh, out on the coast this uh, not only this morning, but also today. We'll talk more about that coming up in your full forecast, but just something to think about. 45 degrees out there in Newport right now here in the metro area. We're sitting at 45. The winds are calm. And those sprinkles we had about a half an hour ago, those have moved out. Here's your weather headlines for this Sunday. Chance for showers early, but we are going to be dry for much of the day. Mostly cloudy this afternoon, but again, as I talked about, may see some sun breaks thrown in there. Dry through Wednesday. And then we have the return of precipitation and some lower snow levels. We'll talk more about that as well coming up in just a bit in your full forecast. Galen. Sounds good, Keely. Thank you so much. We'll see you in a few minutes. We begin this half hour with the coronavirus pandemic. The Oregon Health Authority reports 1173 new cases of COVID-19 on Saturday, and the agency also reported 41 more deaths. Now, this is not a one day total. Those range from dates between December 17th through Friday. OHA did not explain why these deaths were not reported sooner. Now, here are the vaccination numbers too. OHA reported a total of 190,000 shots have now been given. Some of those are second doses, and this is about 56% of the doses sent to the state so far. Now we're seeing final preparations for mass vaccinations in the Portland area, with the four major hospital systems working together. The state is still in the first group, but these events could ramp things up. Kaiser Permanente is working out the kinks this weekend with a vaccination clinic at its Tualatin Medical Office. The goal is to give 3,000 shots, and now this is only in by invite only. Kaiser wants it to be a well-oiled machine, though, by Wednesday when it will launch the first mass vaccination clinic at the Oregon Convention Center alongside OHSU. Leaders know the need is urgent. It's very important to get quickly to herd immunity so we can open up our schools again and we can open up businesses again and get our teachers back and get our, our kids back in school and certainly get our economy going again in Oregon. Kaiser, Legacy, OHSU, and Providence are working together for the mass vaccination effort. Details are still being worked out, but the hope is to eventually give shots to 25,000 people per day. Healthcare workers not connected to hospital groups are starting to get their COVID shots too. Three large independent medical groups started having vaccination clinics for them. The Oregon Clinic, the Portland Clinic, and Women's Healthcare Associates gave out shots yesterday. More than 60% of all Oregonians receive their health care from some form of an independent provider. So it's vitally important that these health care workers do are vaccinated so that they can continue to serve uh, patients as well as uh, keep people out of emergency rooms and uh, hospital settings, which uh, need to be reserved for those that have COVID. Combined, the three groups vaccinated more than 1,000 people last weekend and are expecting to cover hundreds more this weekend. Once independent medical workers are taken care of, the groups expect to join the larger effort focused on the rest of Group 1. Governor Kate Brown has moved teachers in front of seniors for the second group to get the shots. Her goal is to get kids back in school buildings sooner. She's worried about the mental health impact from not being in the classroom, and for some, that's a really big deal. Christelle Kumwe reports. <laughs> We first met Melanie Gabriel in early December at a rally to reopen schools. She's an eighth grader and 13 years old. What we didn't know then was that distance learning was taking a serious toll on her mental health. She told me about it today. COVID and the whole like shutting schools has definitely had a huge impact on my depression. We've heard similar stories from students and parents around Oregon. Isolation from friends and the lack of hands-on teaching led her down a dark path. So it was just so frustrating that I, um, I, I couldn't do it anymore. I was having like mental breakdowns daily, 
multiple times a day. She dropped out of school last spring. Depression is very invisible, and it's kind of hard to tell whether somebody is struggling or not. So it might look like someone's doing fine with distance learning and that they're totally okay with it, but they could be struggling and you just don't know. Melanie is now in therapy and went back to school in October with the help of her family. She worries about kids who don't have that kind of support. Struggling without having like a person there to help you through it is the absolute worst and that can lead to just horrible things. That's something that concerns Governor Kate Brown. Our students are struggling. And it's one reason she's putting teachers in front of seniors for the COVID-19 shots. Um, I talked with um, the CEO and president of Salem Health on my vaccination tour this week. Um, she is hearing of many 11 and 12 year olds attempting suicide. We spoke to Jeff Carr, the CEO of Albertina Kerr, an organization that provides mental health services to young people. He says the pandemic has taken a toll on our youth by cutting off social interaction. I just think kids across the spectrum are struggling. And, and I think the longer this goes on, I think the more... Uh, the more risk we're going to have as a society. Carr believes a return to the classroom will be good for students. Melanie's mom if, agrees. I, if we don't find like a solution soon, it, we're going to lose a lot of kids. Like I, I know lots of people who have lost their children this year, and I fight every day to keep mine alive. So someone really needs to do something about this. Schools in the Northwest are moving toward reopening for in-person learning. For kids struggling with mental health, that day can't come soon enough. In Portland, Christelle Kumwain, KGW News. It certainly is a difficult situation that a lot of kids are in right now. Now, in Washington, school districts are also moving toward getting more kids back for in-person learning, many through a hybrid model. But our Christine Pitawanich spoke with some teachers who say they're not comfortable with that. In mid-December, Washington Governor Jay Inslee announced a phased-in approach to in-person learning, and it's already in progress in many districts, starting with elementary school kids. But I spoke with these teachers who say they don't feel safe and have issues they want addressed before going back in person. I am an elementary music specialist in Evergreen School District. I am the band director and the chair of the music department at Sky Ridge Middle School in the Camas School District. I teach French and freshman English in Ridgefield High School. I'm a Shehala Middle School teacher in Evergreen Public Schools. Adam Aguilera says he has a family member in California who is also an elementary school teacher. And within two weeks of being forced back into the classroom, he contracted COVID-19. While Washington state officials point to research showing limited risk of COVID transmission in schools when safety measures are followed, these teachers aren't so sure. And I would point to a December University of Washington study. The study, involving multiple universities, including the UW, looks at the impact of in-person schooling and COVID-19 using data from Michigan and Washington. Among other things, it found some evidence that in-person schooling is associated with increased COVID spread in communities with relatively high pre-existing levels of COVID. Basically, what happens in schools mirrors what's happening in the community. Right now in Clark County, the COVID-19 activity level is at moderate, with the most recent data showing about 325 cases per 100,000. These teachers believe that is too high, and they've got other concerns too. My colleagues wanted to point out that some of them work in rooms with windows that don't open, that are entirely interior, and there's no ventilation. All those kids are going to need to eat lunch. All those kids are going to need to use the restroom at some point during the day. In addition, they say teachers in some districts are having to choose between going back to the classroom or taking unpaid leave. They're not giving us the option to stay remote. There's also some really inherent inequities. Parents who can afford to take their child to school every day may have less exposure risk than, say, kids who need to take the bus. Even if there is minimal spread, in bringing schools back in person, that's too much for me. And the teachers I spoke to say they know there are teachers out there who do want to go back to in-person learning. But no matter how you look at it, they say school won't be the same as it was before COVID because kids will have to sit six feet apart and wear masks. Christine Pitawanich, KGW News. 
We've got an update here. In the gorge, evacuations are now lifted, but the search continues for a woman swept away by a mudslide. Crews are using heavy machinery to dig through the debris. They think Jennifer Moore's car there is buried under 15 feet of mud. They don't think she survived. Moore was the last one in a line of cars driving along a frontage road near the town of Dotson on Wednesday. That's when the slide buried her car. Well, some uplifting news here. A canine from Olympia that got shot twice is alive this morning thanks to surgeons at Oregon State University. The canine is named Arlo. He's with the Thurston County Sheriff's Office in Washington. He was shot once in the shoulder and once in the leg last Wednesday as he and his officer went after an armed suspect. Police eventually shot that suspect who did survive. Surgeons at OSU spent eight hours repairing the damage and they say the bullet in Arlo's shoulder lodged near his spine and narrowly missed an artery by a millimeter. Arlo was up and walking with some help this morning. Arlo's future may include chasing a ball at the park, but probably no longer chasing down suspects. The sheriff's office is going to retire him. All right, well, wearing masks isn't just helping keep COVID away. It is helping fight the flu, too. The numbers are pretty incredible, and we're going to hear from the Tri-County's top health officer about that coming up.